Hey, I'm Corey Baldwin. And I'm Dan Searle. Welcome back to Off the Beaten Path, a podcast for basketball coaches living in obscurity, working in obscurity, and even those who have made it out of obscurity. It's a place for storytelling, learning, connecting, and uh, food for thought and food for the belly. Today's episode, a couple of real special guests, our first official guests, Kevin Young, assistant basketball coach for the Philadelphia 76ers, and Justin Young. Yes, connected, related. He is the king of hoop scene recruiting across the United States, and especially in the Southeast. Welcome, Kevin, Justin. Great to have you guys on board today. Thanks. We'll be doing some storytelling and some catching up. Yeah, thanks for having us on, I love man. it. Let's it's go. It'll be fun. Let's do it. All right, so you introduced Kevin first, but Justin's the older. Well, I think I was a little disrespectful there, <laughs> sir. Let's start with the big Justin Young. You got into hoops. How? Yeah, great question, man. Like, we have a big family. Like, we, we have there's, – there's six kids in our family, and there's five boys. And so, like, we just grew up just, like, hardcore sports fans growing up in Dallas, Texas. And so I'm the oldest, and then there's, we have a sister, um, Kristen. Shout out, Kristen. And then uh, Kevin, and then we have three brothers behind us. And so Kevin and I you – know, we grew up in Dallas Cowboy era in the, in the early – you know, late 80s, early 90s. And I would argue – Kev, like we were probably more like cowboy people, Texas Ranger people than, than basketball people growing up. But something interesting happened is that like a lot of kids, we kind of like discovered the blacktop and we'd just go down to elementary school and just start hooping. And uh, we really kind of fell in love with that. We played a lot at like church league and stuff like that when we were little kids. And, and there were other families that had a bunch of boys that we just kind of connected to. And I don't know, like I can't speak for KY, but I feel like it just kind of got in our blood and it got in our bones. Because like the Mavericks weren't really like that great. Like we had like Jason Kidd and like Jimmy Jackson, or maybe you throw it back to like Derek Harper and Roe Blackman, Brad Davis, Roy Tarpley, all those guys. Like Dallas Mavericks pilled in comparison to those other teams. And so for us, I don't know what was the obscurity of it all. Um, our dad loved the Celtics. Um, like I love Barkley growing up. Like just kind of like all these random things where we try to find like this – um, you know, maybe like a, people zigged and we zagged and we just kind of fell in love with hoop and just kind of found that passion. So for me personally, like I just kept it going and was obsessed with the NBA draft. And uh, I started like kind of critiquing like an old site called NBA draft.net. And I would send like these like critiques of what he had put out for his mock drafts. And I just kind of hustled and just kind of got in there and, and got to know some people and found out, you know, different things and I'd write stuff and, just kept being persistent and, and kind of getting my foot in the door at the, at the NBA draft level. Um, you know, this is the time where the internet and, and basketball started to kind of become a thing in the late nineties, early two thousands. And I just kind of got in at the right time and, and worked my butt off and, and made some connections and wasn't afraid to get in a car and just go work. And that kind of got me in the door at the pro level. Um, you know, KY was, was still hooping back here in Georgia. And I was up in the Northwest up in Portland. Um, and so that's kind of how I got in. And once I got the door, I wasn't going to stop. And, you know, we can talk about that through there. But for me, it was just a passion for hoops and not taking no for an answer and just kind of letting myself in the door, you know. KY, did, did his uh, journey help your journey or make you hungry? Or, or were you all in, in separate places, even though you were both in hoops? Yeah, I mean, well, as a kid, you know, I just, you know, he was, he's obviously older than I am. And so I was always tagging along with him and his, his buddies trying to just get a, you know, just, I just want to be good enough and cool enough to like play with the older kids. And so, you know, there was a couple of things he mentioned, a blacktop that for me is kind of where it all started. Like I would just run through the alleys in Grand Prairie, Texas and go up to the, to the blacktop and just try to play and just fell in love with playing the game. And, you know, he would go do other stuff and I'd still be going and trying to get up to the blacktop. And then one, one instance that stands out in particular was he mentioned the church league. Like I was playing with him and the older guys. And I remember it like it was yesterday. I hit this guy with a little double crossover between the legs and hit a floater. And I thought like I was like the game winner at game seven of the finals or something. And, you know, they like, I remember him and his, him and his boys thought it was cool. So then I thought I was like the coolest thing since sliced bread. So yeah, that kind of gave me a little bit of confidence as a youngster. And then yeah, I just love playing basketball, even still. Like I play pickup as much as I can. 
Um, I just love the game. I just love playing. I love to compete. And that really ultimately is the genesis of why I like basketball because I just love the game. I love playing and I love, like I said, to compete. And so, you know, with that being said, that's what kind of set me on this, this path of basketball. Then along the way, you know, I had a lot of really good coaches um, that we can get into at some point. Really, it was a, from a high school on is where I really felt like I had some really, really good coaches. Coach, all you guys know, Coach Roger Quam. You know, he's a big mentor for me, still is. I still talk to him all the time. Um, meeting him, playing for him, I thought I wanted to be a high school coach. That's what I, that's what I set out to do. Um, lucky enough to play in college. And then obviously, you know, met you, Corey, and that in dealing and, and playing with you, playing for you and Coach Givens, you know, then kind of got my wheels turning about coaching in college. Um, and, and then, you, you know, you helped me get my first gig at Oxford College. Um, and so it was for me, it was a series of events where it was people that I met in basketball you know, I really got along with, I admired, and I wanted to kind of be like them. And then it was cool to have Justin kind of going in his path in, in the game as well, whereas mine was going into coaching side, his was going into, you know, the media, the recruiting side, and so forth. Um, but honestly, like, one of my biggest breaks was was tagging along with Justin uh, in to Vegas. This was back when it was, like, Kevin Love, O.J. Mayo, Brandon Jennings, uh, Michael Beasley were like headlining the all the big uh, AAU tournaments out in Vegas, and so I mean I was broke as a joke. I couldn't rub two nickels together, but I I, I tagged along with Justin after that year of Oxford. I ended up sleeping in the airport in Vegas to waiting for him to get there because that was the cheapest flight I could get. So he gets there, we go and we end up staying at the Bally's, I think, on the strip for like ten days or something ridiculous. Ten, ten days. It was so sad. <laughs> but the, the the point of that trip and story for me was I, I weaseled my way into meeting uh, Coach Dick Hunsaker at Utah Valley. That's why I really wanted to go coach and uh, basically talked him into letting me come volunteer the, that following year. And, and uh, you know, me and Justin look back on that trip often and, and, and laugh about, one, being in Vegas for 10 days, two, staying at Bally's, and three, just, you know, just – kind of that that attitude of just trying to make something happen and ultimately that that kind of set me into a really through a series of events how I got to where I am today so Corey you talk about this being off the beaten path right yes. sleeping in the airport in Vegas is one of those uh steps along the way as KY tells it huh so a way KY, I think it's find KY, a path to the top KY that's pretty neat so you you're Let's let's go the quick review route here. So you you play at Sprayberry. Travis Tripp was not one of your teammates, even though he's a graduate from there. You play at Middle Georgia, or as you like to call it, Middle Jorge. Yep. And you play for two coaches there, correct? Yeah. So I played for Dale Hatcher my first year, and then he he left, and then Scott Moe, who's actually the women's coach, took over the men's program, and I stayed and played for him, and then. Yeah, that's where He's you still there. First He's still there, yep. Yeah, that's crazy. So that's that's now an NAI school, but it was a JUCO then. Then you came to Clayton. Some real good Division II assistant recruited you. Uh, you played for Coach G. Uh, and then your first job was Oxford, but technically it wasn't. You did a little bit of time at a post-grad, correct? Yeah, I tend to leave that out of the story most of the time. Um, but, yes. It's it actually takes me back when at the time frame that we're in right now, where everyone's just ordering stuff online like constantly. So there's just a FedEx truck. I live on a cul-de-sac, and there's a FedEx truck that just is in my cul-de-sac pretty much every day, all day. It feels like, and it takes me back to not only was I coaching at a, and I'm I'm not even trying to be funny. You got to actually help me. What that was it Summerhill or what was the name of the prep school? I actually truly forgot. What was it called? I think, Mount, I think Mount Olive Prep. It changed Mount name. Prep. Mount Olive there Prep. There you go. Mount, Mount Olive Prep. Prep. Let, hold on. I got to I gotta rewind that just a second. Y'all practiced at a Salvation Army gym in Marietta, Georgia, that, like, no one ever knew existed. It was, like, the bunker for World War III, basically. 
and that's where y'all practiced. It was the most random basketball situation I've probably been to in my career, and I've been in some random places now. That's probably a top five random spot. Not all prep, where dreams go to begin. <laughs> <laughs> not, not only were we coaching at that at that that building, but I was also somehow teaching an English class to to these guys where I had you know, basically no no business doing that either. So yeah, that that was. That was the first, the first, but I would, I would go run a FedEx route from like in the morning and then, or excuse me, I'd go to practice and when practice would end. I would get on this FedEx route. This was long before, you know, you had all these apps telling you how to get to different places. And um, I had these printed out turn by turn directions. I would get so pissed not knowing where, where the hell I was going or anything like that. So it, it, it was a time in my life, honestly, where I, I just was questioning a lot of things. Like, what am I doing? Like, this is a joke. I went to college to do this. Like, I mean, I, it was, I was miserable, honestly. And then it felt like, like a, just an absolute, just godsend when you called me, Corey, it was right around Christmas. And uh, you said, Hey man, I got this guy at Oxford college that needs an assistant, you know, it pays like, I don't even know a thousand bucks for this semester or something. And I said, boy, I don't care. I'll take it. I'm in. And so that's how I that's how I ended up at, at Oxford, and um, that was the year prior to the the, the the Vegas story. But that was the build up to that. So you're at Oxford, then you go work for Coach Dick Hunsecker at Utah Valley. Yep. And you, you practiced a lot there, correct? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I mean, you guys know I was kind of a late bloomer, right? I was physically, I was uh, even in, even as a senior in college, I just wasn't, you know, I, my body took a long time to develop. So, so by the time I got to Utah Valley, you know, I was a year removed from college, and so I, you know, I got into weightlifting a little bit more, and so I was, I felt good, man. I was pretty athletic, body had filled out, you know, I could shoot the ball, and so here we are in a and all these Utah Valley practices. And I was like in charge of the scout team more or less. And I would always have to be the other team's best player. I remember this one day I was coach, we were getting ready to play Boise state and uh, I was Kobe Carl. That's who I was at in the scout team that day. And I came off a screen and like didn't shoot it one time. And coach Hens like it just blasted me. Kobe's going to shoot that. What are you doing? And like, he's like talking crap to me. Like, and so ever since that day, I was like, all right, I got you. And I just started torching every guy in <laughs> practice and, like, at a point where, I mean, I was just going at these guys. And so um, the season got over, and, and Dick uh, Huntsager says to me, he says, hey, man, you know, you can coach for any time you want. You know, you ought to think about playing still. And I said, all right, man, find me a gig, and I'm all in, you know. <laughs> and so – so he calls me one day that summer and says, hey, man, I think I found a gig for you. And I'm like, all right, sweet. He's like, yeah, but it's, uh, you know, it's not a playing gig like we talked about. Like, you're going to be the head coach and the general manager of a team in Ireland, I said. I was, I was kind of floored, to be honest with you. But anyways, it, in about a two-week time period, I, I was interviewed, hired, and on a plane – to Dublin, Ireland, um, at age 23, to be the head coach of the Shamrock Rovers hoops in uh, in Dublin, Ireland, which turned out to be a you know a fascinating life experience and a tremendous coaching. Cut my teeth, not know what the heck I'm doing, experience, and just learn on the fly. So, Justin, while your brother goes back to Mormon country to to hoop a little bit, coach a little bit, now he's going to Ireland of all places. Where has this taken you now? We were, really, we were starting to really hit our stride with rivals. Um, you know, it, to me, it was one of the best eras for prep basketball. I mean, it was high-level guys. We're coming off of, like, Dwight Howard in 04. You know, O.J. Mayo was a stud. But, like, Kevin Durant and Greg Oden, um, you know, Michael Beasley, Kevin Love. Like, just – it was, the to me, the peak of what travel basketball uh, – I, I loved it. Vegas was everything. ABCD camp was kind of, you know, at the very end of its run. Mm -hmm. um, so for rivals, we were really cranking. We'd really found our stride. We really kind of were a bootstrap operation um, and was really pretty lucky to travel all over the country and to see, you know, the absolute studs of what the NBA is now as their prep stars and to watch their journey. And so it was really cool. K-Wise is over there in, you know, Dublin. 
um, and I'm over here, you know, going to New York City and to going to Vegas and to LA and Dallas and in in Houston and of course here in Atlanta and it was really cool. I mean, we're just telling stories and I worked my freaking butt off. Um, pretty aware of how fortunate I was to walk into a situation where we'd have that kind of access. And you know, this is before we had sold to Yahoo. And so we were still a startup company that you had to hustle. And it was also interesting too, from a media point of view, because the internet, um, it's funny, like we weren't necessarily deemed as, as media. And so we were kind of like this one-off where you wouldn't always get a credential. So you had to get really creative. Um, I remember I did a, I did this interview yesterday and I forgot about this, but like I went to, I think it was maybe Kentucky or Auburn or maybe Kentucky was playing Auburn. I can't remember exactly who it was, but, um, this was actually pre rivals I was at NBA draft.net, but like I had to get, I, I, we would always just find pictures of players like off the internet and we would use that as their player profile. Well, I always argued like, let's have our own unique content. Let's go take our own pictures of these players. Well, I couldn't get a credential for this game at Kentucky. I think it was. So I bought a ticket <laughs> and I drive up to Lexington or go down to Auburn where I can't remember the game was. And I, I, I need to have a digital camera. Well, we didn't have digital cameras in the early 2000s. And I learned that you could rent one. You could go get one from the public library. And it was a digital camera that was probably the size of like a lunchbox. And you had to put a floppy <laughs> disk in that thing. And I remember like, I think it was Tayshawn Prince. And I remember like being in the crowd and I had to go down to like the exit where the players were leaving the floor. And I remember yelling like, I think I'm pretty sure it was Tayshawn Prince. Like, Tayshawn. My name is Justin Young. I work for NBA draft.net. I need to get your picture. <laughs> yeah. And so like I snap his photo, like he's like, Oh, cool. NBA. And so uh, I snap his photo, like on this floppy disk digital camera. And like, but like, I, I love that experience because like, that's how bootstrapped and like, that's how renegade like internet media was back then where that's we wouldn't be passive. That's off the beaten path. Right. And so, yeah. But like that was like the hustle. And so like every picture you see of a high school, like of a player in the NBA, if you look back to high school, I probably took that picture, honestly. Like I probably took that picture uh, or KY did in Vegas for 10 days. Like we, we were hustling. And so <laughs> it was like this really interesting place. Like, you know, we, no one had really blazed this path before for the space that I was in, particularly on the rival side for covering like these high level guys and really getting to tell their story. Social media wasn't a thing, thank God. Um, and nobody really told the story. And so you'd go watch, you know, 20 games in a day. And I'd be up, and KY can, can, can confirm this, I'd be up till 3.30 in the morning, like, banging on my computer um, and hoping that they had 60 free minutes of dial-up internet at the hotel to get my story up on the site before any of my colleagues did. So, yeah, I mean, as KY is out there slumming it and, you know, in, uh, in Ireland and hanging out with all the lads after the, after the match, I was over here in the United States, like, banging on a keyboard trying to write as many stories and take as many photos as I could. So, yeah, it's a, it's a hustle. It's a grind, as they say. It's amazing to me, as, as we know the end of the story or, or where we're at now, at least, and both of you have, have done so well, uh, a lot of times in coaching and uh, and other things around basketball other than playing, hard to get to if you didn't play at the highest level. And uh, both of you guys pr prove that you can grind through that and that you have, I think, is neat. Uh, so tell us a little well, more about the... Ireland, KY. So you're in Ireland. Tell us how that went. So you go over to coach and GM. So are you in charge of signing guys or what's going on? Yeah, so um... – he, he, let's keep let's keep the off the beaten path theme, theme. So going back to when when Coach Hunsaker was trying to get a hold of me to tell me about this opportunity in uh, in Ireland, I was I was in like this trying to figure things out phase because I knew I wasn't going to be going back to Utah Valley, and um, so my buddies were like, "Hey man, let's go to Mexico and go on this surf trip." I said, "Okay." So at this point, I mean, we had been out of the season for a while. I kind of, I, again, I knew I wasn't going to be going back there. So I had grown my hair out. I'm like literally in the car 
there's like five surfboards on the top of the of the forerunner. We're coming back into the States. I get a call <laughs> from Dick. I'm on the phone with this lady. <laughs> I'm on the phone with this lady is a female that owned the team. I've got like this long, shaggy, blonde hair. I'm like crazy tan. I'm like, if this lady only knew what I look like on the other end of the phone, there's no way that she would be offering me a job to come over here and coach this team. So once I got the gig, got a haircut, got on the phone, yes, to answer your question, but yes, it was, it, I had to sign players. And so, you know, ultimately what I did was I went to, first went to straight to somebody that I knew. Jonathan Reed, who obviously you guys know played at Clayton State, was my teammate. He had just finished up playing in Switzerland the year before, so I asked him to come be my point guard. And then uh, we signed a big man that was uh, played at, um, I forget, somewhere, one of the small – no, he played at uh, Fayetteville State, I think it was, actually. Pretty good low post guy. So I signed both of those guys and, and got myself to Ireland. And kind of the blessing when I got over there is it was – it was basically like an extension of college. I lived in a house. I got there. They gave me the house. They gave me a hatchback Civic. Keep in mind, they drive on the other side of the road. I'll tell that story in a minute. And it was <laughs> me. It was me, Jay Reed, Kid Ben Br- Bridges that played at Fayetteville State. And then luckily, I had two guys that were a little bit older. One was an Irish national who played on the Irish national team, Ian O'Boyle, who had played prep in the States. Um, so he kind of, you know, he kind of got it. And then there was another kid, an, an, a half Australian, half Irish guy by the name of Luke O'Hay. He was, he's like the Aussie Irish version of Manu Ginobili, lefty, smart, older, crafty, great dude. Mm. Um, so we all lived in the same house. And so although you think, oh, you're going to Ireland, they speak English like it's going to be easy. You can't understand anything anybody's saying. The accents are so <laughs> – and so you know, luckily I had my – Is it my, worse than uh... – Living in Morrow? It's, it's it, you know, they're, they're equally as hard in their own right. Okay, let me say that. You know, shout out to my boy, shout out to my boy, Don, Don Tavius Dawson, who was my roommate that was from Lee County or something. This, Ups was, and Lee. Uh, Ups and Lee. Yes. He would, he would talk, and I would have absolutely no idea what he was saying in the apartment. But, um, <laughs> but yes, it was similar to that. Luckily, my boy Ian, you know, the, the Irish native, he would, you know, he kind of held my hand and kind of walked me through the whole bit. And so the team I was taking over was a team who uh, historically had been really good, um, but they had fallen into some tough years and they were down the last four or five seasons. So anyways, we came out there, started out 7-0 and and like the world was, you know, it was just awesome. We were playing well and we hit a couple bumps in the road and so forth, but and we ended up getting them into the playoffs for the first time in, you know, five or six years and, and had a fun time with it. And uh, from a coaching standpoint, again, you know, I didn't have an assistant. It was me. I had to practice with the with the team oftentimes just to so have 10 guys and stuff. And so I just learned a lot. You know, I learned how to coach older guys. I learned how to, you know, cut a lot of BS out and just and straight shoot the guys. And, you know, you're just going through a lot of adversity – basically by yourself and you're just having to figure things out. So from a coaching standpoint, it was, it was really, really beneficial for me. And then from a, from a, you know, a learning and cultural standpoint, you know, just beautiful people, amazing country, just really, really um, glad that I had that opportunity early on in my career. I know something that was neat for me uh, seeing all this go on was we had went to a final four. Uh, Justin may want to chime in and steal some of this, but, we went to a Final Four all together, and Searle, Justin Young, KY, myself, and and probably twenty of of our other closest friends all stayed in one room together. Uh, and and there's some stories there, obviously. But fast forward to when you came back from Ireland, and the Final Four was in Atlanta, and you had came down and met us, and uh, it was more of you telling the stories and us listening to you instead of the other way around, because at that point you had. You had done some things no no one else in the uh, in the crew had done. So that was kind of neat seeing that growth in a very quick time because I think the other one might have been your right after your senior year. So it was like three or four years later, and boom, you know now you're 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 the grandpa telling the stories to all of us kid kiddos, and we were loving them. So that was kind of neat. Uh, so now you you stay in Ireland how long? Ky a year or two? Yeah. So I was just there for for one season. So before I left. Um, 
actually the, the the day I met the guy who ended up starting the team, me and Justin were were at dinner with uh, our soon to be brother in law and a couple of his his uh, childhood friends, and two of them happen to be extremely successful businessmen in Utah, and so they they go into the you know, they find out Justin and I are basketball guys, and so they start going into all this stuff about yeah you know we love basketball we're gonna start a you know we're going to start a, a, a development league, an NBA development league team in Utah. And like, I'm, I'm like kicking Justin under the table. Like, yeah, right. Like, you know, these guys don't have a, a clue about, you know, basketball or, or even what, what that would take and so on and so forth. And so anyways, I told them, Hey, well, you know, I just got this job in Ireland. I'm about to go take it. You know, let's stay in touch. And we, we did. And so sure enough, man, to, to, to my surprise, and Justin's, I'm sure as well. They they went ahead and put it. Uh, these two guys started the, the D League team it, there in Utah. And so when I got back from from that Final Four that you're talking about, I flew out to Utah. This was back when the old Rocky Mountain Review was at Salt Lake Community College. Um, and I interviewed with the GM and the head coach that they had hired, and they gave me an opportunity to join uh, to join onto uh, onto that team. Man, that's awesome. So now you go back to Utah again. Yeah. So that's that's pretty cool. So now you got a um Justin, you jumped around. So now you went from writing about writing about NBA guys or guys getting drafted into the NBA to uh AAU circuit where I'm sure you saw Dandy Dan Searle <laughs> with the Georgia Stars running around coaching them up. So now where do you go? Rivals ends up getting bought out by Yahoo, kinda walk us through what happens then. Yeah, so, you know, we uh, – Rivals really became really huge in the mid-2000s. Obviously, most of the business was sort of around uh, football recruiting, particularly here in the South, SCC, ACC, uh, and even the big – you know, Big Ten, Big 12 um, was huge. And so we got bought up by Yahoo uh, mid-2000s, which is really quite amazing. You know, I remember I was up in Philadelphia uh, for Reebok All-American camp, and, and, like, I'm blowing up John Wall talking about – this is the best player in the nation. No one's really outside of North Carolina has ever heard of him. So like I'm rushing back to my hotel to like publish the story about this kid named John Wall. And like, we all need to know who he is. Like he wasn't a guy that was on anybody's radar. And I think I wrote like, he's the best player in the nation without a doubt. Um, wow. Just his speed. And so I go back to my hotel and to write this story to publish it or something. And uh, there was this huge package at my hotel, this purple box. And uh, in it was basically like, you guys, congratulations, welcome to the Yahoo team. And at the time, you got to understand, like Yahoo was bigger than Google in, the, in that era. Um, like it was the homepage of the internet. And so for us to get purchased by something like Yahoo was mind boggling. And, you know, I, I love my time at Rivals. We had some amazing, hardworking guys that like truly did it for the passion like going back to like you know off the beaten path like i remember how i got my job um i was talking to they they hadn't really got into basketball and they were looking to hire uh, a full-time basketball person and so I, I don't know how i got connected with them but i ended up talking to the person that was doing the hiring and they were down in orlando at au nationals in the early early 2000s and they're like hey are you here in florida we'd love to meet you and i'm like well no i'm in atlanta and it was like in the evening time it was like six seven o'clock at night and I was just, I was a newlywed. I was probably, probably married three or four years. And they're like, oh, it's too bad you're not here. We'd love to meet you. And they just kind of said that. And I was like, okay, well, I'm going to drive. So I drove to Orlando overnight and got there in the morning. And I was like, hey, let's meet for breakfast. And they're like, well, where are you? <laughs> and like, well, I'm here in Orlando. They're like, I thought you were in Atlanta. Like I was. I drove overnight to meet you guys. <laughs> and so like to go from that kid that was just hungry to get a job um, to go to a place where we sold our company to Yahoo was really quite an amazing journey in such a small amount of time. I and mean, then Yahoo was great to go work for like a major, major company. Um, and again, at the time, like I'd write a story and in 10 minutes, I'd have millions of people that read the story. If we had like a really major story on the front page of a pro, uh, you know, publication like Yahoo. So that was a really important time. And in hindsight, I wish I'd have had the the understanding to how big and important that was for my career. And then of course the dot com crash or everything crashed in the late two thousands. And that was into that, um, into that run. But, you know, it taught me a lot. Now here I am as a, 
you know, business owner and, and, you know, what we have going on at Hoop Scene, but it taught me a ton of great lessons about leadership and, you know, visions and entrepreneurship um, to really be able to build the platform that we have here now going into my ninth year with Hoop Scene, which is insane to think. Um, but like all those experience, and Kevin can probably say this, and same with you guys, Dan and, and Corey, that every job and every season prepares you for the next one for things that you don't realize that you didn't need, you didn't realize you needed to know these things. And so it's been really this amazing journey to stack one thing on top of another um, to get better as a leader, to get better as a dad, to get better as a colleague and, and you know, a leader of your own program. Um, yeah, that Yahoo period was really fascinating. We were playing with Monopoly money, man. A lot of people were playing with Monopoly money at that time. Um, and then so to have it all fall apart really taught you a better lesson as to what life's all about and how you prioritize things differently. And now how then as a leader do you apply those things and what you do every day? So it was cool, man. Quite a journey. I'm glad I went through the journey in my 20s and early 30s to make me better as a 40, 50-year-old. You know, So that's the good part about it. Now, now, Justin, did you go to any of the games when KY was coaching in the uh, in Utah, <laughs> Utah Flash? Um, no, never in Utah. So Kevin's first game, this this is a story. Okay, we tell this story a lot. It was Kevin's first game as a head coach, right, KY? Is that right? Yeah. So I yeah, lived in first, Southern first, Oregon. Yeah, first it was my first game coaching as a head coach in the D-League. Yeah, okay, that's what it was. Um, so I lived in Southern Oregon. We have another brother named Daniel that was – Kevin, was he your roommate at the time? Yes. Okay, so he lived in Salt Lake with KY, and I lived in Southern Oregon, and they were playing in Reno, <laughs> okay? And this was Thanksgiving weekend. Well, it snows in the mountains, boys, in, in the wintertime. That's a science tip if you didn't know that. And mm -hmm. so there was this massive winter storm that was blowing through. And I, we grew up in Texas in the South. Okay. So the most snow we've ever seen is maybe like, you know, an inch of ice that shuts down the city. Right. Mm -hmm. So I get like a four wheel drive car from my in-laws at the time. And I make like the 13 hour drive to Reno to go see KY play like Thanksgiving weekend. Okay. Reno sucks. Let's just be clear. Reno's awful. <laughs> so like I'm leaving Southern Oregon to go to Reno to watch KY coach. Well, here's the issue. This massive snowstorm comes blowing in. I get to like the California Oregon border and I can't see literally six inches in front of the car and I've got to get off the highway to go over the, uh, over the Sierra Nevada mountains to get into Reno. Well, it is. So I'm like going up this hill and like it's snow chains required and I've never driven in snow my whole life. And so like I put on these chains and I would drive like maybe 500 yards and you hear thud, 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 thud. And the chains would pop off and they'd hit the wheel well. And I, and I probably stopped, I'm not kidding you, 25 times to reinstall these chains on these tires, which I've never done in my whole life. I've never even looked at an instruction, nothing. And so I'm sitting there sweating, okay? I'm sweating because of the amount of work that it takes to put these chains on these tires. In the middle of like, who knows where, I've got no cell phone service and it's just nothing but white snow everywhere. So I'm sitting on the back of like the Chevy Tahoe or whatever I was driving. And I'm like, all right, the next car that I see, if it has chains on its tires, because I'm like debating if I should keep the chains on or not. If they have chains on those tires, I'm going to turn around and go home because I can't, like I hadn't gotten close to like how treacherous it's going to be ahead and it's not going to be safe for me to drive. So I'm like waiting for a car and on the horizon, I see these lights come up the hill. I'm like, here we go. Moment of truth, bro. This freaking like 1972 Buick comes flying up the hill. This 80 year old guy with his head barely above the steering wheel and he's cooking, man. And I'm like, all right, screw this. So I ripped the tire, the, the snow chains off and I throw it in a four wheel drive and it took me like literally like 14 hours. It should have been like an eight hour drive, like a 14 hour drive to get to Reno. And it was the loneliest, strangest place. Cause Reno, Kevin, it was like what? 12 degrees outside, just snowed ice everywhere. It was just awful weather. And uh, that was KY's first game as a head coach in the G league. And I, I wasn't going to miss it, man. I wasn't going to miss it snow or not. I was going to get there. And so that was cool. But like that, that to me is like, I love that story. But like, if you know the Youngs, man, we're a tight knit group and we will go to hell or high water to be there for each other. And so like, I wasn't going to miss that, man. That was awesome. Tell us so more about know. that. Tell us about that young connection because it's true brotherly love going over the Sierra Nevada with no uh, chains on your car and never driven in the snow, but you'll do that. 
Yeah. Like, like literally like no hyperbole, like 14, 16 foot snow drifts. I mean, it was, it was like a pretty historic snowfall. That's crazy. Um, yeah. So to, to like get there and then like we walk around, we walk around the loneliest city of all time and like Thanksgiving, it's freezing cold. Like it was the saddest casinos of all time. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's five of us. Like, I don't know if you guys saw like that first or second episode of the last dance where Jordan's talking about like his brothers and like how competitive they are. And like any great athlete, you guys are coaches, you know this. To me, like every great athlete I've ever met has a sibling that's like super competitive. I mean, we're super competitive. Like everything, like we had so many fist fights <laughs> growing up in our house. I and mean, we all played sports. And what's funny, because like our dad is like the nicest human being you'll ever meet, but not like a, like a guy that's like super athletic. Now our mom, she'll get in the ring with Mike Tyson and, and, throw, and throw freaking haymakers, okay? <laughs> He's super competitive. But well, like the the question is, did you win that game in Reno? The first one in the D League with the family coming over the mountains to see you. So we uh we we did not win that game. And, uh, <laughs> I know Justin and, and Daniel that, that were there, our other brother, they were they were sitting pretty close to our bench and uh you know I was you know, I was young. You know, I was young and and, and Cyril and C V you guys know when you're when you're a young coach core, you, you you might still be this way with how fiery you get, but like especially when you're young though, it's it's really hard to control your emotions because you just you're just so competitive and, and you just you're just not thinking clearly. You're just you're just you, you get so wrapped up in the emotion of the game, or at least that's how I was as a young coach. I think I've changed since then, but I was there was a few timeouts and, and, and or, or incidents, instances with the referees where I would just, I mean, I was just one step away from just, just losing it all together. And I, and I happened to glance over at Justin and Daniel. I could tell that they, <laughs> the concern was extremely high. Like, <laughs> what the hell is this dude doing? Like, this guy needs to get it together. <laughs> what did uh, you do with our brother? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it was, you know, we lost that game, you know, um, Another little side note of that story is is I was, you know, I was a little nervous going into that game. I was, you know, I was going – Eric Musselman was the head coach of the other team. This guy has been a head, had been a head coach of like two or three NBA teams at that time. You know, I'm a 27-year-old dude who like came out of Ireland and Clayton State and all these different places. I'm keep up with the must bus. Yeah, exactly, right. And so, we, you know, we uh, – me and – we ended up having a lot of good battles with, with that team. Um you know, over the course of that season, a little like their backcourt, as an example, I don't know, I think it was that particular game, but at one point in the season, their backcourt was Jeremy Lynn was a starting point guard and Danny Graham Green was a starting two guard. NBA players. But, yeah. yeah. You're going up against some, some legitimate talent there, but just on a quick side note, I want to go back to one thing you asked about sort of like the young brother and sister for that matter connection, you know, and Corey, I know you're super tight with a lot of your cousins and whatnot, like for us growing up, like our my yeah. both my parents are from out west, basically California and part and some of Utah, and so you know we were the only part of 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 our family that lived you know east of the Rocky Mountains, and so you know we had no cousins growing up. You know, grandma and grandpa at that time, you know, we'd we'd be able to talk to them on a long distance call for like three or four minutes at a time. You know, every holiday or something. And my dad traveled, you know, a lot for work. And so it was basically our siblings, you know, my mom. And then, you know, when my dad was in town, and so we became really, really tight because that's all we had. You know, that's, that's all we had. And so I look at it with my – I have three kids now. I have two boys, you know, six and four, and then a little girl who's two. And, you know, my, they're, my boys, for instance, they're already pretty much tied at the hip because we're the same way. We live out east. Everybody else is either down south like Justin or out west. And so you know, I think that was a big factor in how close we were as kids. And, and it's been really quite amazing to see how it's really held, held true as we've all gotten older and stuff. So just, each other's backs. That's awesome. Yeah, man. One of the things I like to think about uh, the movie Hoosiers, I'm going to go old school. But you remember the uh, the young lady who liked Gene Hackman in the movie? Mm -hmm. I guess the mom of the shooter. Mm -hmm. And she tells him that story how she hated basketball because after every game they would win or lose, the whole family would stay up late and rehash the entire game, and it would completely ruin the next 
day or two of of regular life and that's the way the whole season was and she just didn't understand why i think of that that's probably my life being you know my family satterfields and my family now uh and i probably think the youngs probably had some of those where there were some games that maybe justin or ky or even even, even the twins or, or you know whoever in your family had and and uh there were probably some late nights rehashing it and and going well, you know it's probably do it now it's, right it's, it's funny Corey. Like I, I wrote this like right when we all went into quarantine, and I and I would hear this this statement a lot, and it kind of it kind of bothered me. And I'd hear people say, "Well, we need sports because it's our escape," and I, and I don't and I don't agree with that at all. And like for everybody that's probably listening to this, or you know, in our circles, like it's our life. And so like for like the Youngs family isn't unique to this. Okay, the Baldwins are this way, the Searles are probably this way, and everybody that's listening to this is probably this way. Like, it's the thing that connects us all, okay? Like, we live all over North America, our family does. But on game night, like, we're all in the same text thread. And and for us, like, <laughs> it's still the thing that, like, connects us all together all the time, you know, despite everything that we've got going on. And in the moment, in the game, like, it's a pretty spirited uh, text thread. And you would think that our mom, Jody would thought TJ McConnell was part of her sons as well, to be quite honest with you. We always would struggle with <laughs> Um, but like, but like, it's the part that I still really enjoy, but you know, the older you get like that comment that you made about the Hoosiers and like the next day, like, like it, the part that I've enjoyed is like not letting that be a part of your life. Like in the moment it's your life, but like, like the thing that I have always appreciated about it is become the thing that's really brought us together the most. And so like this whole quarantine thing has really been tough. Um, but it's made you pivot outside of that conversation of like, oh, I can't believe like he missed the shot. Sorry, KY, I don't mean to bring this up, but today, today's the one year anniversary of the infamous Kawhi Leonard shot, right? And like, like that was like truly like a day of mourning was the next day because like this, this is the sheer like unfathomable uh, process of what that all was. Like there was some mourning collectively in that, but you know it's it's been fun to have that connectivity uh, as a family but it's also been pretty cool to like let that also bring us even closer you know so that's that's the cool part about it yeah it's good stuff that's good stuff all right ky so walk us down you're an assistant at utah flash mm -hmm. uh at one point i think you were a part-time guy selling tickets to make ends meet or maybe doing something with like uh, ancestry.com or something like that yeah. am i correct Yep. Yeah. So it, it was, uh, it was actually similar when I was doing the deal with the, with the, with Utah Valley, you know, it was, I was really just after the opportunity, the first year uh, with them was, you know, I was making okay money and I was trying to sell tickets on the side and that was a joke that didn't go too well for me. So um, I just focused on hoops and in the next year they're like, Hey man, we really like you, but we're, we're scrapping budgets and we're doing this. So I, I went from making like, no money to making like absolutely no money. So, <laughs> so I, yeah, man, I would, uh, I would basically, we'd have practice in this facility and there was a, uh, there was a security company that, that owned the facility. So I would work, do practice, do film, do all that. Then I'd head over and try to sell uh, home security over the phone. Um, and that kind of gave me enough scratch to pay my rent, you know, buy a foot long sub and eat off that for a week and just made it work basically. And then, uh, you know, that didn't last forever. That was a, it was a couple of years where I was doing that. Um, and then going into my fourth year with that team is when I was, uh, the head coach contract was not renewed and they, uh, they bumped me up to be the head coach. So that kind of put me into kind of obviously a little bit of a different space. So you were an assistant for three years. Yeah, I was an assistant for three years. And one of the cool things, uh, it wasn't cool at the time. I absolutely hated it. I was pretty much pissed off for three straight years was, you know, because keep in mind, I had, I had just come back from being a head coach, right? I was like running my own ship. I was doing signing whoever I wanted. Every, you know, I made all the decisions. And then I come to the deal in Utah and, you know, the, the, the job was kind of sold to me as like, a, you know, you're going to be an assistant, you know, you're going to, but you're also going to set up our video program and so on and so forth. Well, that turned into like, yo, you're going to do every single thing. It was basically like an ops position and a coaching position and a scouting position all kind of tied into one. But the ops side of it took all the time and effort. And, and, and you did a lot of driving, right? Didn't you have to pick up yeah. other teams? 
And so that's where I was going with it. So we were based down in Provo, Orm area, and teams were flying to Salt Lake. So I'd have to drive a 15-passenger van with another guy and go pick up the other teams every time somebody would come in, drive them back down, drive them to shoot around, drive them back after the game or whatever. And it was miserable. I couldn't stand it. But you know, I was able to meet a lot of – you know, that's where I met a lot of coaches, honestly, guys that I still talk to that are in the NBA now. Uh, like Quinn Snyder, as an example, that's kind of where I first met him and got to know him a little bit and some other guys who are assistant coaches in the, in the NBA. So, you know, it, it was it was trying times, to be honest with you. And it, and it, it was uh, it was a good thing. I was young and, and didn't really care much about anything at that time. I just was like, hey, man, I'm just going to do this and hope for the best. And hopefully something comes from comes from it. And, uh, you know, luckily stuff did. But it, at the time, man, I was uh, – it wasn't easy. I think that's the neatest part of both youngs, if people are listening, is uh, some people see people when they get great positions like you guys have now, and they assume, man, silver spoon in the mouth or whatever BS they might want to say. Sounds like you, you worked your tails off and did a lot of dirt work that most people wouldn't have stuck with for two weeks, more or less three years, and uh, just to get to – a little bit better job. All of us are in positions where we've had to hire people, right? Like, like right. we've been fortunate enough to be in positions to be able to hire people. And like, we hire hundreds of people for our season. And I get, we work like a lot of interns. And it's been really amazing. Like we get a lot of applications and resumes for people that want to come in here and get a job. And I say no to probably 98% of them. And like, I go back to like, I'm like, man, I just had a brand new baby or my wife was pregnant and I drove overnight to be there when the sun came up just to meet somebody to get a, to, to hope to have a job. And like, like when I interview people here, I'm like, okay, um, why don't you get here at seven 30 on Saturday morning and we'll be done probably around 11 o'clock that night. And if you can make it through that, like, they're like, really? Like you want me to be there all day? I'm like, yeah. And like, we do that for 14 straight weeks, <laughs> you know? And like to be a coach, like, yeah, I remember Kevin would call me when he'd do those airport trips. Remember those KY? You'd call, you'd be so pissed. I hate this. I can't believe I'm doing this. I just want to coach. And it was like, bro, you got to put in your, you got to put in the work. But like, it makes you better appreciate every single facet that goes on. Like, I think, I think through like this time, like away, like I'm up here at Sony Sports Academy today. Like, you don't have any, like, people, if you're trying to get into coaching, if you're like an entry level coach listening to this right now, there are so many more things that happen outside those 10 guys that are in between those 94 feet that go into being in sport that you have to understand almost all of it, or at least have an experience of it all to understand how hard it is to work in sport. Because here's the beauty of it guys. And, you, and we all know this, this is an amazing job. Like we're so lucky to be like in this, in this space. And so to do all those things to like put in that work, like this is not a silver spoon stuff. Like most people's last names aren't, um, you know, Auerbach. Okay. Like I don't know what Red Auerbach's son did for a living, but I imagine it probably has something to do with basketball. Mm -hmm. But like, like you got to work, man. You got to really, really put in the time. Um, and, and it stinks in the moment, but man, it gives you so much better perspective in the end. Question for both of you. You say it stinks in the moment. You talk about you know, pounding the steering wheel as you're driving from Provo. How do you get through that? How, without perspective, the young coach listening to this, do you say, this is worth it. I'm going to stick to it. I'm going to put in those 12, 14 hour days at the Georgia World Congress Center or at SSA. So Kevin and Justin, what, what's a, either a family phone call, as you mentioned, or something in your own brain that helps you work through that? Yeah. I mean, for me, I, I don't know. I just, I just always, I don't want it to sound cliche. I just always just believe that good things would happen. I just believe that if I just stuck with it, something would come of it. I, I believed in myself. You know, I, I look back and I think about people that I've met, you know, that were older than me that gave me encouraging words. Like, hey, man, like just, you know, you're pretty good at what you're doing. Stick with it or whatever the case may be. You know, I just had that inner belief. And honestly, like now, even just going through this conversation that we're having with all four of us here, you know, I look back at some of the things that like Justin did to get his foot in the door. I look back and think about some of the things that my dad did to provide for a family of eight, 
And, and what that did for me was it just showed me like, I thought, honestly, I thought what I was doing was actually normal because I saw my, yeah. dad, be yeah. a, my dad be a grinder, you know, like some of the stuff that we haven't talked about and are some of my actual, actually my favorite memories of Justin and I in basketball was, you know, I would go, I would tag along with him to the peach jam for, for, for years when I was in, with, with, uh, in college and so forth. And, you know, he talked about I would try to be sleeping on the floor of the hotel room. I would hear him up there pounding on the on the computer, on the keyboard. And, I, you know, I know he wasn't making a ton of money at that time. So, you know, for me, it was almost like this example of I just thought that's kind of what you did. You know what I mean? You just figure it out. I just – I think guys that are successful – and I was at a coaching uh, clinic this, this, uh, this summer in Vegas, actually. Rick Carlisle was talking, and he said – you know, one of the things, one of the biggest things that he looks for is an assist in his assistant coaches. Is, and I'm paraphrasing, is basically guys that can just figure out how to get things done. Period. And, and for me, and, and again, I speak about our dad, and then I again look at kind of what Justin did. I mean, that to me is the bottom line: figure out ways to get things done. And if you can't take it, you're just not going to make it. And if you can take it, most of the time, at least something, something good will come of it. It seems to be a theme. We talked a little bit last week, uh, me and Searle, and I can uh, – not to make it about us, but we both were talking about multiple jobs we had to start in coaching so we could coach. And KY can even remember this. I used to work in uh, Smart Bodies, which was like an aerobic center at 5.30 in the morning I had to be there. And it didn't matter how late the night went. I would wake up some nights with an hour sleep, some, some nights no sleep, and just roll on in the little smart bodies, you know, and that was kind of part of it and might hop in a car and drive to Panama City and back in the same day to see a game. And uh, just kind of some of the stuff you do. When you look back, you laugh a little bit, you know, like what the heck was I doing? But uh, but you see it, KY said it best. I think I got it from my pops too, because he was just a worker. He was a worker, man, just what he did. Like I would imagine like this podcast, as you guys are doing it, you're probably asking like, we probably hear a lot of similar stories like this. Like, and we all have like people in our life, like I know for Kevin, you know, coach G and like his high school coach, coach Qualm are like really important mentors and people that he still looks up to. And like, for me, like I had a high school journalism teacher who was a retired, like he was a photographer for the army during the Vietnam war. So like, if you can imagine like what this guy saw through a lens and he used to tell me when I was a kid, you know, coming up through his class, like to me, his name is Robert Mitchell. He's the single most important guy outside of my, outside of my blood that affected my life. And he, uh, he would always say, know everybody in the room. And he said that like when he was a photographer in, in Vietnam, like he needed to know where every soldier was at, whether they're going to die or not. And so I, I it, like, what a like somber thought. But like, mm-hmm. I think about that every time I go to a new gym, like, do I know every person in this gym? Like when we moved to like when I was here in Atlanta, I didn't I didn't go to high school here. I didn't I'm not from here. You know what I mean? Like I'm from here now, but like I didn't know one soul. And I think too for like a young coach, like I've hired I've hired most of the people that we've hired here at Hoop Scene is because I watched them. I didn't I didn't I, I sat back and I just watched them work the room. Okay. So like if you're listening, you're trying to get the job with us, come to one of our events whenever they come back, work the room. Know everybody in the room. And like, I think coaching is the same thing. Like, do you know that person? And like, we hear, we see a lot of stuff on Twitter and we all hear like the same stuff, like our emails and our texts and our phone calls. Hey, I hope all is well with you and your family. And I always thought about this. Like, what if you pivoted the question to tell me more about your family rather than hope all is well with your family? Like, we don't really know, like maybe things aren't well. So tell me more about them. And like, like this really like human experience and to like going back to like why we all do what we do. I think that's the main thing. Like, what's your why? Like, what's your purpose? How do you get through those things that you're doing those, not just 12, 14 hour days, but sometimes those 18, 20 hour days, right? Like you're breaking down film at three o'clock in the morning. You're like, why am I doing this? Hmm. Why am I doing this? Like, do I really love it that much? Yeah. Everybody has a story and you as the journalist have have figured out the answer. You got to ask. And so many times we don't ask. And that's what we're trying to do here with this podcast is ask oh, about it. those stories. Tell us about the family, the young connections and, and mm-hmm. this hard work. And, and Kevin, Justin talked about work in the room and getting to know everybody. How did that help you? You're driving the van back and forth. You're meeting the Quinn Snyders and some others. 
how did you meet everybody in the van and did that help you get to where you are today at the Sixers? Yeah, I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not as good as Justin is in terms of like, you know, work in the room, so to speak. I, I'm, I, I'm a little bit more reserved when it comes to that kind of stuff. So I had information that everybody wanted because I knew all the players intimately because I was driving the van. I was practicing with them. I was working these guys out. Like, I knew these guys. And so I used that to my advantage to build relationships with a guy who was a scout right, that wanted to know about this player. And now all of a sudden, now this guy's a GM for an NBA. And, and how, how that, you know, we all kind of came up and, and we've all – made different moves and now guys that I've met way back when you know again some guys a GM some guys in a, a head coach for an NBA team or whatever and so it really expanded my network and and it was for me it was easier because it was more organic and it wasn't like a forced thing trying to get to know all these people and so that 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 that, that has helped me in terms of as I navigated like through the D-League and got different jobs in the D-League and who I met and so forth and how that led to, you know, me getting to the Sixers. The camps and all the people you work camps with over the years across the country and where those paths take you, right? Yeah, For sure, yeah. yeah. Corey was dragging me to Clemson and Auburn camp and everywhere else when, when I was coming out of college. So walk us through it real quick, KY. I know, I know it's uh, the back of your, your card here. So you're, you're assistant with the Flash, three years, your head coach with the Flash. How long were you the head coach there? So I'll fast forward a little bit through the rest of the D-League career. So basically, I was with uh, – I was the head coach of the Flash for one year. That's That season is when I met my now wife. And so she was going to BYU. I was coaching the Flash. It, it was a perfect fit. It was great. I'm like, hey, I'm going to ride this out. And then we got married. And then basically right after we got married, the owner's like, hey, man, I'm selling the team. So um, <laughs> my whole – yeah, my dream scenario went to the wayside. And so that year in the playoffs, we had played the Iowa Energy in the playoffs. Nick Nurse, who everyone knows now, but nobody knew him at the time. He was the coach of the Iowa Energy. We had a, a, a hell of a series, actually. This guy named Michael Haynes hit a literally a three-quarter court shot off the glass in game two of that playoff series that basically pushed him into winning that series, and they won the league that year. That propelled him to, for the Rockets to hire him to go coach their G League, D League team, which opened up the Iowa job. And so that's how I basically got the job in Iowa. I was there for a year and a half, got fired halfway through my second year with my wife was pregnant. So we got married, didn't have a job. She got pregnant. I got fired. So I was hitting all these bumps along the road, figuring out what the heck it meant to be a basketball coach. And uh, that, that one set me back though, to be honest with you, that one, uh, that one put me on my heels a little bit. I was trying to figure out what to do and uh, you know, kind of, and, and looking back on it, that's when you go think about all the driving the vans and this and that. I'm like, Hey man, I've like, I've done this before. I'm going to be fine. Even if I have to take a step back and go be an assistant somewhere again, like, so be it, I'll do that. And so I was fortunate in, in, in getting involved with the Sixers uh, D league head coaching search. Um, I had a couple years prior interviewed for a job at the league office and, um, to, to go actually help run the D-League. And one of the guys that I interviewed for there, fast forward a couple of years, ended up being the assistant GM for the Sixers. So I knew him a little bit. And uh, their process was taking forever, and I just couldn't wait much longer. So I actually committed to going back to Utah Valley to work for Coach Hunsaker. And he said, hey, man, like, I'll hold this job for you. You need to listen to the Sixers. I don't care how long it takes. And I'm like, coach, you have a – your season starts in like a week. You've already held it long enough. And so, to this day, man, I owe that guy a ton. He gave me peace of mind of, of, of holding it. I mean, they literally played – imagine this. They played – and, of course, you know this. They played two regular season games, and he did not hire anybody. He, he left the job open for me. And finally, long story short, I didn't get the, I didn't get the head coaching job and, and – with the Sixers G League team in Delaware. They offered me to be an assistant. I called Coach Shunsager. I said, hey, man, like, screw these guys. Like, I'm coming to Utah. He's like, dude, you need to go to Delaware. It'll be, it's better for your career. I had a six-month-old baby. I packed up all my crap in a pod. 
I came to Delaware by myself, unloaded the pod with a couple Mormon missionaries on a rainy Sunday night and started, <laughs> and started the season as an assistant, making back going back to making not too much money living in Delaware, which I knew nothing about. And then without my wife and kid, they ended up coming out later. And so um, that's ultimately how I got out to the East Coast. And I did that for – I was an assistant with Delaware for a year. And then I was the head coach of, of that team – uh, the following two seasons. And my first year in Delaware was Brett Brown's first year in Philadelphia. And so, uh, you know, again, organic relationships, I, it took a while, but I, you know, I got to know him and so forth and cultivated, you know, that relationship. I was fortunate enough to be around quite a bit actually during the draft. And that's when I would be calling Justin pretty much 24 seven, asking him about prospects. Cause now I'm, I'm actually kind of doing what he was doing. I'm back now on the scouting scene when I wasn't in the D league season, they asked me to be involved in a draft. And so that was kind of what got my foot in the door during the Sixers early days was putting out draft Intel and doing all this kind of stuff. And once that kind of ran its course, ultimately Brett finally got a position on a staff, called me on Memorial day four years ago and asked me to join his staff. And that's, that was the start of me coaching with the Sixers. Man, that's awesome. So, so, so Justin, when he gets a job with the Sixers, and you see him on TV the first time, whether it was coaching a summer league game before he was officially with the Sixers or when he was on the on the staff there on the bench and you see him, what's going through your mind with all the work that you've you've done and you've seen him do and kind of like both of you making it at that point, I would think. Um Yeah, I like I'm so competitive, I just didn't care. I thought his tie sucked. And like you need to do his hair differently. So like I was like, yeah, good for you, bro. You got to step up your game a little bit more, you know. <laughs> no, it, it was cool, man. I mean, it's still cool, you know. Like, but like, you know, you're still your brother. You know, it's still just your family. You're like, okay, cool. He's on TV again. Like, it's funny. Like in your world, like again, you kind of know what the why is. Twenty, you look back twenty years ago. You're like, okay, well, like it's not, it's not like a surprise to me. It's just like, okay, cool. You know, like, even my kids. Like my kids are, you know, I've got two teenagers and, and uh, like a basically two, uh, 11 year old, nine year old. And, you know, like, oh, yeah, yeah, like our uncle's, you know, he's on TV. It's no big deal. You know, like, so like, it's just kind of like, yeah, you just kind of, that just becomes very normal. Um, but, you know, it's cool. Like, nah, let, me while, let me interrupt real quick because let me interrupt though, real quick. One, one, one of my personal favorite memories of in my life to this point is, is the first. It was actually, I don't know if it was the first because the logistics didn't work out, but one of the first home games that we had when I, uh, in Philadelphia with me as an actual NBA assistant coach, my entire immediate family there's, and their spouses all came to Philly and came to the game. So we have a picture of all of us at half court prior to that game. And, uh, you know, that's one of my personal favorite, yeah. favorite that memories. Was cool. that, was, that was yeah, cool. That's cool. That's awesome. That's awesome. All right, so so we're starting to slowly wrap up. I got two quick questions before we wrap. Both both questions for both of you individually. All right, give me your favorite place that you ate at during your journeys here, all these journeys. JY, go ahead, because I know you probably got a pretty long list. I got a, I got two that stand out for me. You know, and it's got to yeah. be somewhere you work, you know, somewhere where within you work, not somewhere like you – you travel and stop through. I'm talking about a, one of the jobs you had, a place you eat. Well, that's not really fair, CB, because, like, <laughs> I don't have, like, I, I'm, listen, you can't ask a fat guy a food question not have him have, like, 17 answers, okay? <laughs> Go ahead. So give, give us, give us my something. Favorite, my favorite, just because it's tradition, is Nacho Mama's on Broad Street in Augusta. Like, that's a staple going to the Peach Jam. Love you got to go to Broad Street. Shout out Nacho Mama. I still haven't got a discount. I still haven't got a free burrito. I've given you all probably <laughs> going back now <laughs> over the last 20 years. But Nacho Mama's in, on Broad Street in Augusta is my definitive go to. I love it. I love it. All right. KY, you got one in, in, in Philly or, or Delaware or Utah yeah. or. Uh, I'll still, I'll, I'll be, you know, being that cheesesteaks are kind of the thing Philly's known for. I think my favorite cheesesteak spot is, uh, is Sonny's in Old City, Philadelphia. If anybody visits, I've actually taken Justin and Daniel there after one of our games, but 
that's my favorite cheesesteak in town. But on a quick side note, that's one of my favorite things about being in the NBA is going from city to city and being able to hit up, uh, you know, a lot of different uh, restaurants and things like that. And I know you only asked for one, but I don't even remember the name of this place. Whatever hole in the wall, literal trailer that you took me to when I was playing at Clayton in Jonesboro somewhere where they have an unbelievable pulled pork sandwich. It's like back in the woods. They give it to you in a little <laughs> brown paper bag. Beans, I don't remember the name of the place. Beans Barbecue. That place is unbelievable. Beans. Oh, there's a few of them. That is, that is, that's my favorite. It's no longer there, unfortunately, but it was open forever. That was a place 50 years plus. All right, so my other question to end with, I, all, all, all these journeys, you know, we had a lot of six degrees of separation. Y'all saw Searle on the road. I coached KY, recruited KY. Uh, I got to use Justin's computer at the Final Four so I could get my stories turned in. It all, it all connects, doesn't yes, it? Yes, and you turned it this uh, Gigante Spanish typing only. Uh, Unbelievable. Ruined Justin Young. I think that's uh, – he lost like three jobs off of that. No big deal. I mean, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> but – with all these all these things that's that's going on for both of you guys and the amount of people you met, which is awesome. But but what is the the one thing like now that you have kids, both of you have kids, that that you would like to teach them from what you've learned in coaching? Or being in basketball or playing, all those things. Uh and I asked this a little bit to learn too, because because I you know, I've got two kids and I think sometimes like KY said, I'm so dang competitive. Sometimes I don't even want them around me when I'm involved because I, I don't want to see because I'm too competitive sometimes no I mean I, my, mine's actually fairly easy we, we we touched on it a little bit I mean I go back to the the probably the thing I've taken from my own dad and it's just the work ethic piece it's mm -hmm. you know my my coaching career is, is really not that dissimilar from my playing career you know I was a guy I mean who was not that good honestly I was just skinny dude that just tried really hard actually and competed as hard as I could and you know, I, I took pride in doing all the stuff that just took work, you know, because I wasn't really that good of a player, but I just made it happen with, with my determination. And ultimately, that's how I've kind of made it in coaching. Now, there was a lot of luck, and I was fortunate to meet a lot of good people along the way, but um, that's what I'm trying to instill in my, my kids is, is no matter what career they go into, just the work that it takes to, to try to be successful and, and keep your head down and just plug away at it and just, you know, really just put everything that you can into it. And I know that that does sound cliche, but for me, that's really the only kind of recipe that I've known as both a player and a coach. And that's what I'm hoping to share with my little guys and girl. I love it. What about you, yeah. DOC? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I'm the same thing. Like the work, the work, work is the hardest part. Um, and like the doing is the hardest part. And I say that all the time to my, to my team and my kids, but like for me, for my, for my girls, I have four daughters and, you know, I try to tell them all the time, just block out all the noise, like all the things that don't matter. Don't worry about it. Don't get caught up in all the stuff. And it's, it's really cliche. And we hear it all the time in coaching you can control what you can control. Mm -hmm. Stop worrying about the opinions of anybody else. Like no one cares. No one's in that journey with you and just put your head down, do the work, um, understand the why. And don't worry about all the things that don't feel you. Like we hear this all the time in, in basketball, like, oh, I want to prove the haters wrong or the doubters wrong. I actually, I take a complete 180 approach to that, that mindset. Like I want to prove the believers right. Like that's always been my like mindset. Like I don't care about all the people's noise. I just, I genuinely don't care. I want to be around mm -hmm. people that believe in what I believe. I want to be around people that believe in the vision. I want to be around people that believe in completing the goal. And that's all I care about. And so for me as a father, um, that's what I try to help my kids understand more than anything else is like your circle has to be the single most important thing in your life. I and thought, that's it. Uh, that's awesome. Man. I thought Jordan said it best the other night on, on, the, uh, on the last dance when he said to people who, who didn't understand him or didn't get it or the critics that were coming at him, he really didn't care because he wasn't doing it for them anyway. Bingo. I, I, simple as I that thought, is, it's so true. I got chills just hearing you recount that. Like, that is the single most important thing. And any team that's successful gets that, right? Mm -hmm. Like, your yeah. locker room understands that. Those you know, bus rides together understand that. If you have a great team, collectively, y'all understand that. And the teams that have losing seasons, I can guarantee you, 
if you go back and do like a, a postseason survey, that that the answers won't be unified, and that's why they lost. Almost. You know, Coach Coach G told me something when I became a head coach, and when he originally said it, I remember thinking like, man, Coach is getting old. He's senile. I don't know what the hell he's even talking about. But about five weeks into coaching, I I knew right away, and I, I think about it every day that I coach now. And he said, CB, you won't be good old CB anymore once you become the head coach. And you got to understand it's okay that people hate you. And you got to be okay with it because that, that you can't let it mess with you. And I remember when he said that thing, I'm like, what the hell are you even talking about? But I knew five weeks in exactly what he was talking about, and it still stands true. You know, I've been a head coach now 14 years, and, and people just for whatever reason, hearing Jordan say that the other night was good for me because it refreshed it. You know, you got to just stay focused on what you're trying to do and who you're trying to help and uh, let all the haters hate and move on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Well, I, I know we went kind of long, but I think we could have went even longer. You guys were great. I mean, me and Searle didn't have to say a lot in this one. We could have just let y'all roll. The young brothers hit a home run, as always. Better than the Bash brothers, the young brothers. They went yard good. Searle's one of the best. Searle, give us, give us how they can find us on social media. Hey, we appreciate everybody listening, Justin and Kevin. But give us a follow on Instagram, at Off the Beaten Path podcast or Twitter with Off the Beaten Path, with a little underscore. Join us there for the conversation as it starts to grow and send in some questions. We do appreciate everybody listening to this Off the Beaten Path podcast. And hey, it's a show for those who want to coach, those who used to coach, those who are coaching, those who follow coaches, and those who hire and fire the coaches. So join us, Off the Beaten Path.